one of the things that I do at the moment is um, advising smaller companies on how to get themselves ready for sale and then helping them to exit um, if actually what they want to do is get themselves ready for a you know, long-term, multi-generational family scenario and not sell, I can help them with that too, but most of the ones I come across actually do want to sell. Um, my background, I spent the best part of 20 years as a sell-side equity analyst where I was talking to institutional investors about the valuation of companies and their strategy. I then spent a bit of time as an investment banker. Don't throw things at me. They're not all bad people. Um, and uh, spoke to a lot of the big uh, multinationals about what they wanted to buy, um, worked on the sale of a number of smaller companies and realized that there was a big opportunity there to do more than, than just sell these companies, um, but to help them um, on their preparation toward, towards their exit as well. Um, oh. So I'm going to talk to you um, today about a few as aspects of preparation for exit, some of the things buyers look for in a target, some of the um, drivers of valuation, and then finish up with some thoughts on what you might want to look for in a buyer, because there is some choice in the matter. If you want to exit smoothly, it's never too soon to start thinking about getting your house in order. Most people make a few mistakes when they're setting up, and that's either because they don't know any better or because they work with partners who take advantage of them. And it's much cheaper to fix these issues early if you can. So you need to get your contracts right. You've got suppliers, distributors, customers, advisors, employees, a whole lot of people to deal with. And all of these people require contracts. Every single one of those contracts requires care even if you think you're dealing with a friend, because sometimes these friendships don't last the duration. So first of all, at the heart of the issue is that you're sharing in value creation. You're, you're, you're going to need help with setting up your business, with creating this value along the way. And you need to make sure that you are sharing the value that's created appropriately with the people that help you. And care over your contracts will ensure that your partners receive appropriate incentives, get a return on any investment that they make, and prevent them from overreaching when you come to sell. So whilst it's only fair to give some share of the upside where it's deserved, some of the demands for things like exit penalties can be absolutely egregious. And you've got to bear in mind that the costs associated with extricating yourself from a bad contract are going to come out of your pocket when you come to sell. So looking at the contract structure, your business is going to evolve and the contract needs to be able to accommodate that. So when you're ready to sell, if the contract needs to outlast your ownership, then it's going to need to be fit for your buyer. Whether it's a keeper or not, you're going to need to think about change of control. So a word on intellectual property. You, might, you, you, you must be clear about the ownership of all of the brand assets right from the start. If you have partners who help you to create your brand, then you need to be absolutely clear as to who owns whatever it is that they have helped you with. And this includes things like recipes and designs. And obviously, it goes without saying that you need to register your designs, trademarks, etc. And just as an anecdote, I've seen real-world examples of brands that have come to sell and realized that they don't own their IP, don't own their designs or their recipes. They haven't been able to register trademarks in important markets, or they have accidentally given away the perpetual distribution rights for a particular market that's important. And all of these things can be resolved, but they take money and time and stress. So, um, moving on. So, Maria's covered quite a lot of the um, financial aspects, um, and it may be a bit scary to think about all the finances, but even if you don't come from a financial background, you must have a proper grip on your financials and your business plan. 
at whatever st stage you've reached, the more granular your business plan, the more likely it is to be realistic, the more likely it is you'll be able to deliver it, and more to the point, the more likely it is you'll be able to fund it. So you do need a lot of detail short term, less detail but cl clear expectations for the longer term. And I would say that if you have a brown spirit that is aged and you're laying down inventory, you need a longer business plan because you don't want to come to a point where you are forecasting sales growth beyond the capacity that you have to lay down that inventory. So you need to spend the time, think it through, keep it up to date, look at different scenarios. Maria said the same. Be prepared for any eventuality because the world is changing very fast at the moment. So I think Maria has covered most of the aspects of accounting, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but suffice to say, external endorsement of your numbers can give them a lot of cred credibility and prevent problems arising. And collecting the numbers the right way actually does help you to run the business better as well. So data. Data is really important. The more financial and commercial data that you can collect and analyze, the better. And I know that's not easy because data costs money and for the most part you're going through third party intermediaries. But you do look at the various KPIs for the development of your business and these are vital in demonstrating to a buyer that your brand has traction. So we're talking about granularity on things like where you're selling and who the buyers are. Um, and that means tracking sort of various um, basics like points of distribution, rate of sale, um, social media s stats and things like that. And it's stuff that you know that's in your head, but it also needs to be in your files. And finally, if you can collect data on your environmental impact and do your best to reduce it, that's becoming increasingly important. But I do think this one's quite difficult, and I think Emily's got a whole session lined up to, to talk about that. So investors, so I think we've touched a little bit on investors at the moment uh, already, but um, you know, just to, to, to go through the various stages of investment, your early stage investors are likely to be people who know you. They're investing in a concept and they'll do that if they trust you and they believe in you to make it happen. They'll probably be with you for a long time. They'll be with you through a lot of ups and downs. And it's important that to the extent that you can choose them, you choose them wide, wisely. As you get a bit bigger, you'll get in front of angel investors, family offices, investment clubs, and there's you know, crowdfunding out there that's been quite successful in this industry. What they all have in common is that you need to be very clear on the proposition that you are putting forward to them. You've got to be very clear on the business plan that, that you're expecting them to invest in. And you need to capture their imagination. You need to be prepared to sell yourself to them in the same way that you're selling your brand to your customers. Once you get into institutional investors, and I should say one big difference with institutional investors and strategic investors is that they don't have synergies. So they really need to get their return through the financial improvement of your business on a standalone basis. And you should expect them to want a lot in return for their money in terms of both return on capital and influence over your business. The flip side is that you can benefit from their experience, especially in financial management and in the exit process, which they can help with. Um, quite a lot of founders prefer to cut out the institutional investors and go straight for the um, strategics. Most strategics, when they invest on a minority basis, do it with the expectation that there will be a path to control, um, but it does help to, to cut out that extra return that's going to the institutional investor. So one word of warning about the institutional investors is that they will do their best to reduce their risk and maximize their ups upside. That is their job. And what we're seeing coming through is some investors that come in with what look like very attractive high entry valuations but then with some sort of a preferred return which can effectively wipe you out so be careful about those so the outside investors are taking a lot of risk and pretty much any outside capital is going to be expensive for you 
So the best way to avoid the dilution and giving away the value that you're creating is to run your business as profitably as possible and minimize the cash burn. Again, I think we're singing from the same hymn sheet here. Clearly, there's a balance. Most companies need some sort of outside finance, but this is not tech. It's very hard to finance long-term operating losses, so you're going to need to keep on top of your costs. And apologies if it's all very obvious, but I do speak to a lot of people who think it's all about growth and that prof profitability doesn't matter, but it does. So, looking at the um, end buyer and the strategic priorities for them. First of all, focus. Multinationals absolutely cannot deal with com complexity. They're set up to move a lot of boxes, even at the top end of their businesses, and they, they just can't deal with myriad of SKUs. So product focus is, is really important. They don't want to see a vast array of different SKUs. They want critical mass in a core product. Obviously, innovation and special editions can be extremely important in raising the profile, especially for a brown spirit where you've got some you know, age special editions and cask specials and all this kind of thing. But this has to be accompanied by some sort of rotation with a limit on the number of SKUs that are in any particular channel. And quite honestly, if you do have excessive SKU proliferation, if you look at those SKUs on a fully allocated cost basis, there's probably a bottom end of them that are just not profitable anyway. So then geographic focus. There's no point sending a pallet here and a pallet there to 50 different markets or 50 different states in the US and thinking that you've got global domination. All that happens is that a few bottles end up languishing on some far-flung retailer's shelf, gathering dust, reminding that retailer never to buy the brand again. The multinationals are interested in sales that demonstrate true brand building and real traction in any particular market. So it's better to focus on a smaller number of geographies where you can support the brand with what it needs in terms of marketing and salespeople and get that real genuine traction. Ideally, by the time you exit, you'll have a strong domestic position, genuine proof of concept in a couple of key geographies and perhaps some seeding beyond that, but, but that will do. Obviously, the holy grail, if you can achieve genuine scale in several markets, that is hugely valuable. It takes a lot of time, real brand building, and there are very few independent brands that actually manage it. And actually, in the last I know, month or so, we have two examples of independent brands that have managed that. So Brown Foreman has just bought Gin Mare and Diplomatico Rum, both of which have achieved genuine scale in a number of markets across Europe, and that was the attraction of those brands, especially as it's at a premium position. So consumer positioning. On the whole, the multinationals are looking for premium and above positioning within any particular category. So you're going to get a good valuation for a scale brand at a high price point in pretty much any category. So even if you're worried about the fact you're not in the hottest category, if you're in the right place and you get that scale in terms of the consumer positioning, you, you will get a good price. You can also luck out and get a good valuation for a less good brand in a very hot category. And that has happened um, in, on several occasions in, um, in recent times. So then on management, um, I think Emily discussed a little bit that um, multinationals do sometimes look um, not just for the brand, but for a skill set. And that skill set might be as simple as being entrepreneurial, but it may be specific expertise in something like a category or a channel or a market. And obviously, if you sell on the basis that they want your skill set, you're probably going to have to stay for a while. So getting on to what you're probably all here for, the key drivers of valuation. So the different multiples that you see quoted are a snapshot for a discounted cash flow. Consequently, the factors that drive higher multiples are actually the ones that equate to the factors that drive higher DCF value as well. 
Just while we're on multiples, there is a very high, uh, wide range of multiples that you see out there in the market. Um, you can have multiples of either case volume, net sales value, or contribution. But those, those multiples have a very wide range because every brand is different. And they're different in their positioning, they're different in their business model, and different in their outlook. So you shouldn't necessarily look at those um, pre precedent multiples and assume that the very highest ones are going to apply to you because they might not. So looking at the various factors and you know, running through them, um, first of all, and very importantly, obviously, is growth. The growth trajectory and the runway for further growth is critical. However, it's the quality of growth that really matters. Um, buyers want to see genuine consumer traction, not just pipeline. Scalability, technically this influences the terminal value of the brand, um, but as I said earlier, multinationals deal in big volumes. They want to add brands that can run efficiently within their platform, and they want brands that have the potential to move the needle for them. So a whole lot of things go into scalability, including the quality of the brand and sufficient supply to fuel its growth. But I guess the big question is, how big do you actually need to be to demonstrate that you have what it takes to get bigger? So there isn't necessarily an optimal size to start looking to exit, but my observation would be that the multinationals are currently looking for brands to be a little bit bigger before they start to buy them, and that's because they've learned from recent forays into smaller acquisitions that they're actually quite difficult to integrate. So moving on to the... Uh, positioning, it's really important to be at a price premium because everybody is trying to premiumize their portfolios. They want to buy brands that are accretive to their, their, their overall positioning. And higher prices generally drive higher profit per case and higher event value and therefore a higher multiple. So that all flows through very easily. Obviously, profitability is going to drive value too. Normally, after an acquisition, the profitability is going to be enhanced by synergies, and these vary enormously depending on the business model that you operate. So the multinationals interested in the margins that the brand can generate when it's incorporated into their own platform. And this means they normally look at brand contribution as their key metric, and that's effectively gross profit minus marketing, and it's the profit for them in their system. And then on capital intensity, with brown spirits, there is clearly value in the inventory that you have available to support the future growth of the, of the brand. On the other hand, buyers aren't particularly keen on big capital projects that haven't yet been completed because those have a lot of uncertainty as to how much they're going to cost. I mean, everybody who's done a building project knows that um, there are cost overruns um, as a general rule. So you've got your buyer lined up, you're ready to sell. How are you going to fit in with your buyer and what should you expect from your relationship with them? Before you sell, you need to be comfortable with the implications. I have actually seen a situation where a founder has got all the way through to signing on the dotted line and then gone, oh, no, 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 I, I can't sell my brand. So first of all, if you sell control, that does mean that you have sold control. And you're going to have to live with the decisions that go with that situation. And that's difficult. The founder can end up feeling like a glorified brand ambassador. There are a lot of benefits that a buyer can bring to the party. But if you've got a staged transaction where you have to stay on for a while, you may have to compromise on some of the things too. And these staged transactions are pretty common in, in this industry. So obviously the buyer brings money, and that's likely to include an earnout, and that means that you're going to have to work to achieve the targets that are set for the earnout. And just a little word of warning on the earnouts, you need to think very carefully with your forecast and your business model as you go into the transaction whether you really believe that you can deliver those targets, because if you can't, you're not going to get your earn out, so the value that you think you're getting will be dissipated. The big thing normally is distribution. Route to market is hard for small brands. 
you long for the utopia of the multinationals platform and all those lovely salespeople. However, you're going to have to compete for the attention of those salespeople with the portfolio of brands that the multinational already owns. And some of those are going to take priority over your brand. And that can be extremely frustrating for the founder who's, who's just sold. You also might want to tap into their purchasing, their admin, their marketing, all sorts of things that they can do cheaper or better. And you can do that, but you may also have to live with doing it their way. And some founders find this difficult because they have left the world of the big corporates behind them and they don't really want to go back to all of those constraints. So a lot of this stuff is easier if you've got someone in the buyer's organization who's taking responsibility for you and sponsoring your success and the success of your brand. So I would always recommend that you find that person as you go into the transaction and make sure that they own you. So to wrap up, despite the volatility in the background environment, the rising cost of capital, all the stuff that's going on around us, my perception is that the multinationals, whether they're listed or private, are financially very robust and have a continuing strong appetite to buy really good brands. So if you create something special, they will come. And that's me.